Back in the uh, 1950s and 60s, there were a lot of new discoveries in the uh, field of elementary particles, but particularly the uh, strongly interacting objects, objects participating in the nuclear force in one way or another. The nuclei, atomic nuclei, were uh, thought of as composed of neutrons and protons. And uh, in some sense, that's, of course, still true. Uh, but in the uh, 1950s and 60s, first in cosmic ray experiments and then later in uh, accelerator experiments, uh, new objects were revealed, uh, sort of uh, heavier brothers and sisters of the neutron and proton, uh, all called baryons, and then uh, heavier brothers and sisters of the meson or pion. And nobody knew where to put these new particles, or what to make of them. Uh, one puzzle was that they uh, were produced copiously in cosmic rays and later on in particle accelerators. But they took a long time uh, to decay, a long time to disintegrate. and. Uh, it's important to realize, of course, that what's considered a long time in this field of, <laughs> of physics, the time it takes light to cross a nuclear particle, is uh, something like, uh, well, a, a normal time would be 10 to the minus 23rd seconds, 1 over 1 with 23 zeros. Uh, and the times that people were talking about for the disintegration of these objects was something more like 10 to the minus 10 seconds, one over 10 trillion, one over 10 billion, a 10 billionth of a second, something like that. So they were called uh, strange particles because they had this property of being produced copiously as if they were strongly interacting and then decaying slowly as if they were weakly interacting. And I helped to solve that puzzle. The Eightfold Way scheme suggested immediately the possibility that something like quarks could be the constituents of neutrons and protons and all their friends, and the pion and all its friends. Uh, just a simple inspection of the uh, of the uh, particle chart would suggest immediately uh, the quark scheme. What was difficult was believing that it had any relevance, that it could be right in some sense, for uh, three reasons. There were three beliefs that were widely shared and made it impossible to believe at the same time in the quark scheme. First of all, people were convinced that the neutron and proton were elementary. If they're elementary, then they're not made of simpler things, whether called quarks or not. Uh, so it was necessary to overcome that accepted idea. Second accepted idea was that uh, the electric charges of the quarks are plus two-thirds and minus a third. Correspondingly, the antiquarks have charges minus two-thirds and plus a third. Well, everybody believed that the electric charges of fundamental particles in units of the proton electric charge had to be integral. Zero, plus one, minus one, maybe plus two, minus two, but not two-thirds or minus a third. So there was an, another unnecessary prohibition that was being violated by the quarks. The third one, that the quarks were permanently trapped inside particles like the neutron and proton and could not escape singly to be used in industry, for example. That was a new idea, that a, partic that a certain kind of particle could be permanently trapped inside observable objects like the neutron and proton. So the difficult thing was not noticing the quark scheme. That was essentially trivial. 
The difficult thing was taking it seriously in view of its challenging these three accepted ideas. Uh, but that's occasionally necessary in science. It happens from time to time that what's holding up theoretical progress in a certain field of science is belief that you mustn't have such and such. Everybody knows you mustn't have such and such. But in fact, it's a, an unnecessary and false prohibition. And you can have such and such. <laughs> when you look at it, there's really no reason why not. Uh, by the way, in uh, the... Uh, uh, strangeness scheme, I encountered exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, people were convinced, the theoretical physicists were convinced that uh, if a particle had half integral value of one quantity, it had to have a half integral value of another quantity. And if it had an integral value of one quantity, it had to have an integral value of the other quantity. And this wasn't true. <laughs> but it held up progress for quite a while. And I decided to ignore it. It wasn't a necessary prohibition. It was just something that people had dreamt up for them, to make it difficult for themselves to understand the, the situation. Uh, on a much higher level, uh, Einstein faced something like that with his special theory of relativity in 1905. Uh, Ever since Isaac Newton, people had believed very strongly in absolute space and absolute time. Well, by Einstein's time, uh, a couple of other theoretical physicists were already working with the transformations between space and time that, that, are, uh, that apply when you go from a, f one, a frame in one state of steady motion to a frame in another state of steady motion. They're called the Lorentz transformations because they were written down by the Dutch physicist Lorentz. Uh, but Lorentz didn't take the additional step of saying, forget absolute space and absolute time. There is only the relative space and time that we discuss uh, in the theory. Uh, we don't have to worry about how it relates to absolute space and time. They're just unnecessary concepts that we can throw away. And Einstein was able to do that. So that's another much more striking, much more important case of an unnecessary prohibition that had to be violated in order to make progress. People have compared uh, my work on classifying the uh, strongly interacting particles and uh, also some of the work on the weak interaction in elementary particle physics. Uh, some people have compared all that to the work of Mendeleev in the 19th century in classifying the uh, chemical elements according to their properties and according to their atomic numbers. But uh, actually, uh, my colleagues and I did more than that. Uh, it's interesting that uh, we were able to do more than that, and it says something very special about our field of elementary particle physics, in my opinion. I've written about it. We studied symmetries, and the classification, say, of the strongly interacting particles depended a great deal on symmetries and broken, in particular, broken symmetries, approximate symmetries that were violated. At the same time, we knew that underlying the, uh, the whole picture must be a real theory, a real dynamical theory describing the, uh, the various particles and how they interact and making predictions about them and so on and so forth. Not just symmetry, but dynamics. Now, at times, we thought that this learning about the detailed dynamics would be far in the future. Here we were uh, snatching the low-hanging fruit by looking at symmetries, and uh, in particular a lot of broken or violated symmetries. But uh, 
then there would be the long, hard work of trying to find what the actual dynamic theory was, dynamical theory was, and so on. But it turned out that because of the magic of something called gauge theory, we were able to skip a great deal of that hard work that we thought was lying ahead of us. In gauge theory, it turns out, the symmetries determine the dynamics. So in studying the symmetries, we were actually uh, laying the groundwork for writing down the correct dynamical theory. So the, uh, what's now called the standard model uh, came, rather much more, ca came much more quickly than uh, many of us expected. Once we understood the symmetries, we had the key to the dynamics as well. Now, that's not generally true in science, that by snatching the low-handing fruit, you also get the whole tree. <laughs> but gauge theory uh, and most theoretical work in elementary particle physics, especially at that time, was uh, built on gauge theory has that remarkable property that the symmetries determine the dynamics. And of course, it's the same kind of property that Einstein uh, appealed to in constructing his general theory of relativity, which gave his dynamical theory of gravitation. In referring to it as general relativity, we're talking about the symmetries of the system. In talking about it as Einstein's theory of gravitation, we're talking about the dynamics. And in his case, the dynamics uh, more or less followed from the, uh, from the symmetries. And it was a kind of gauge theory.